Welcome to another episode of the Bandage Podcast, a weekly wrap-up of the most trending healthcare news. Each week, we'll discuss the latest in healthcare, health IT, and compliance. In this week's episode, we discuss Clark County's involvement with student mental health, universal healthcare laws going through the California State Assembly, and the first ever transplant using a genetically modified big part. Let's wrap things up. This is episode 120 for the week of January 17th. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Albert Battistelli. Before we get started, our diagnosis code of the week is W61 or contact with birds, parentheses, domestic, parentheses, wild. (laughs) Why even specify then domestic or wild? Like why not just contact with birds, parentheses, all? (laughs) Like why two sets of parentheses? That's a good point. I I wonder if there's one for like vultures, scavengers. Scavenger bird, bird. I would say those are wild. Like I don't like. I almost read domestic as domesticated, and then it had mm. wild. And I was like, it's domesticated and wild. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I like that it's just like contact as well. It's just like I said hey to a bird. Like the bird landed near me, or I, like I don't know. It could be anything. It maybe, could be any. Maybe the bird flew. Maybe it scratched you. Maybe it pecked yeah. you. Yeah. This may be the maybe most it looked at you. Yeah. You got a heart this attack. Could be- the vaguest diagnosis code we've had in a while. It's very, anything could have happened with a bird, any kind of bird. Yep. Yep. Anything could have happened. Who knows? There's a bird involved. It's all we know. So it's known in your state and or country mm-hmm. and it's wild. Mm-hmm. So good luck with that. Maybe or domestic. <laughs> could be a pet bird. Who knows? Yep. And with that, let's get into the news. First up, we have progress for adolescent mental health. The pandemic is taking a huge toll on Las Vegas students' mental health. The Clark County School District, or CCSD, plans on connecting students with professionals and trained teen ambassadors to provide help with mental health. When students were allowed back on campus, it created a greater focus on mental health. Students can talk with trained student ambassadors, making it easier to open up to peers about mental health. Students can also connect with a mental health professional virtually through Hazel Health. CCSD is using $2.5 million from the American Rescue Plan to launch a system that addresses the mental health needs of their students. This effort is concentrated within Clark County so far, but the hope is that this push with telehealth and student ambassadors can be offered throughout Nevada with the help of state leaders. Nice. Yeah, nice. You know, I think it's good. Yeah, I think any focus you can draw to mental health is important, especially nowadays, pandemic, like everything is so weird. Like, I don't know, I feel like everyone's in their heads all the time. It's so important to, like, focus on your mental health. Like, just as important as your physical health. Maybe more important sometimes. It's like a silver lining of the pandemic is a big focus on mental health. Yeah. Because there was a focus on mental health, but now the focus is even bigger on mental health, I feel like. Exactly. Because of the pandemic. So, it's good. That's a lot of money um, to use. So, Mm -hmm. I wonder how big Clark County School District is because... I mean, they must be big. If it's 2.5 million, that's huge. Right. Must be big. Yeah. Especially like, I mean, Clark, that's where Las Vegas is. Yeah. So that's got to be yeah. a pretty sizable district. I mean, not much else in Nevada. <laughs> it's like Las Vegas <laughs> and like, I don't know, Reno. Like there's not too many yeah, like right. <laughs> big places. So I would imagine yeah. it's their biggest school district. Well, hopefully, you know, they're leading the way. Hopefully other states follow suit in or yeah. school districts and other states follow suit. But if they do, they need to find a better way or a less expensive means to do this. For sure. Yeah, it's a lot. Because not every state or school district has $2.5 million that they could just devote. Exactly. Even if it is the American Rescue Plan, right. I don't think the American Rescue Plan probably has that much money for a large scale. Maybe it does, right. I don't know. But I, I right. at the moment, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, and it just depends, I guess, on what the school district, want, what, where they want to prioritize the money, too, because I guess they could probably use it for multiple things, but hopefully more prioritize mental health. Right. All right, next up, we have potential health plans from progressives. California lawmakers started debating last Tuesday whether to create the nation's first universal health care system, a key measure of whether the proposal has the support to pass this year. There have been two bills filed, one that would create the universal health care system and set its rules, the other that would lay out how to pay for everything by raising taxes on some wealthier individuals and larger businesses. The first bill got a hearing last Tuesday before the Assembly Health Committee. Because the proposal was introduced last year, it must pass the state assembly by the end of January to have a chance of becoming a law this year. The plan for universal health care requires at least two-thirds vote in both houses of the state legislature. 
After that, voters must approve it in a statewide election. So this is California. interesting. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, so this is interesting because I feel like we always talk about healthcare on like a national level, like the need of like the federal government to sort of like regulate healthcare plans and make sure everyone has equal access and stuff like that. But it's it's right. interesting to hear how a state w- might handle that individually. I know, I think Massachusetts was the first state to pass universal health care, like way back in the day. I think Mitt Romney even was the governor then and like signed it mm-hmm. for his state. But um, right. yeah, I, interesting that California already didn't have something like this as well. Yeah, California is like, if anything super progressive is going to happen to the government, it usually starts in California. They kind of sure. like just beta test. They're like yeah. a beta tester for progressive legislature. So for real, and they're like a small country. I mean, they're, they're the population of a small country. Like right. California is huge. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, it makes sense that they do this. I mean, there's mm-hmm. like, it's like the two sides of two coins, right? You got Texas, who's like the beta tester for Republican policy. <laughs> yeah. And California, yeah. that's the the beta tester for liberal policies. So we'll see how this works out. Um, you know, I mean, universal health care. If people who live in other countries will tell you that, you know, usually that's a good thing. Um, and then there's always a little bit more red tape involved in, in America for that kind of thing. And it's always been a, a problem. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but, you know, I'm not surprised that California is the first or one of the states to try to push this through their state legislature and handle it within their right. own state bounds. For sure. Next up, when your new heart used to oink. David Bennett, a 57-year-old Maryland man with terminal heart disease, is doing relatively well after receiving a genetically modified pig heart and a first-of-its-kind transplant surgery. The pig heart was the only currently medical available option, according to the University of Maryland of Medicine. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration granted emergency authorization for the surgery on December 31st. Three genes that are responsible for rejection of pig organs by human immune systems were removed from the donor pig, and one gene was taken out to prevent excessive pig heart tissue growth. Six human genes responsible for immune acceptance were inserted. Bennett's doctors will need to monitor him for days to weeks to see whether the transplant works to provide life-saving benefits. He'll be monitored for immune system problems or other complications. It's too early to call the heart transplant a success, though. That label will come only after Bennett has decided that he has a good quality of life for months. Whatever the outcome is, though, it's important for researchers to learn something that can be applied for future transplants. So yeah. every now and then we get a story that's like some medical breakthrough. Mm-hmm. And this has been getting a lot of publicity overall because it's a pig heart. And it's like, it, yeah, I, I've <laughs> read at least a few articles about this already, just like being shared on Facebook or social media and stuff. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, it's interesting. Hopefully mm-hmm. it works out, I guess. You know, it would be very interesting for to be the doctor who, like, you know, decided, hey, I got to go to David and talk to him about this potential thing we could do. Right. I wonder what criteria, like, you have to meet to get into these, like, super interesting, like, potentially innovative first of its kind surgeries. And Right. I feel like you have to be, it has to be, like, a last resort. Like, literally, yeah, like... Right you know what, we're just experimenting on you at this point. We're just going to yeah. try this. Like you're pro- like, it's probably n- not going to go well, but you don't really have a shot anyway. So we're just going to see yeah. how we're going to see it. it might, like, yeah. And then it ends up working well. It seems like this was very complicated in terms of yeah. genes. Didn't know. Yeah. Which is just amazing to me that we have that ability to just be like, okay, we're going to take these genes out, but leave the rest. And then we're going to yeah. put more genes in. I was like, what the heck? Those. I don't even yeah. know how you can identify them. It's like, no, it doesn't. I mean, what? It's bonkers. <laughs> yeah, it, it it blows my mind pretty much is what you know. No, for sure, for sure. So um, hopefully it goes well. Uh, and if this works, I don't know how, I guess they'll have to mass, I guess it's like a mass production thing where it's like, it probably costs a lot to remove those genes. But if you could replicate that heart on a massive scale, maybe it decreases the cost associated with it. Because I imagine it's very yeah, you know, I'm not a medical supply chain expert, and I'm also not a doctor. So hopefully it goes well. Yeah. With that, let's go into our next segment. B-R-E-A-C-H. Breach Patrol. It's a breach! All of the latest cybersecurity breaches. 
Welcome to Breach Control. We talk about the latest breaches all across the world. Albert, what do we got? All right. Panasonic in a probable pinch. Japanese conglomerate Panasonic Corp. has disclosed that job applicant and business partner data were stolen in a breach that the company first revealed in November. Although the data breach was first detected on November 11th, previous reports suggest that the breach involved unauthorized access starting June 22nd. The company still didn't reveal the exact details of how the data breach took place in its January 7th announcement, instead referring to the incident as unauthorized access to a computer file server. However, reports have stated that hackers gained access to Panasonic's networks and personal information for job candidates and interns, which could have grave ramifications if the information falls into the wrong hands. Grave ramifications? Yeah. Uh, Not necessarily. Well, I mean... Potentially, if they fall for a phishing attempt or something like that. Yeah. But the, it doesn't seem like the information stolen in this was too, too bad. I mean, it's still a breach to a massive conglomerate that makes everything from, like, electronic True. toothbrushes to TVs to right. refrigerators. And, and, and they haven't appliances. specified, yeah, what data it was either. No. No. They, they just said that it's information, personal information from job candidates. So... Yeah, so hopefully no like it might be network information. Thing. This is a newer this is a newer breach. It just happened yeah. January 7th, so it's fresh off the presses. Um so there's probably more developments that are going to happen down the road. Um mm-hmm. but Panasonic probably has really strong cybersecurity. I'm going to assume that I would think. being as big as they are, yeah, probably has some cybersecurity safeguards in place. Yeah. So with that this goes to show you that it's not a matter of when a breach is going to happen to your organization. It's a matter of, or it's not a matter, let me re say that. It's not a matter of a breach happening to your organization. It's a matter of when it actually happens. So right. you got to plan for that incident response. So we'll see how that happens and how that pans out. Next up, Illinois is informing patients of security issues. Online pharmacy company RAVCU and Fraternity Clinics of Illinois, or FCI, have both informed thousands of current and former patients of data breaches involving troves of their sensitive information. HIPAA Journal said 79,943 current and former patients were sent breach notification letters informing them that their passport numbers, social security numbers, financial account information, payment card information, treatment information, trading physicians, treating physicians, medical billing claims information, prescription medication information, and Medicare, Medicaid identification information was leaked. The FCI said it became aware of suspicious activity on its internal systems on February 1st, 2021, and determined that patient information was involved by August. The company did not respond to requests for comment about the delay in informing victims, but said in the notice that they were offering one year of free credit monitoring and identity theft protection services. So, that's a long time between February 2021 and August. I mean, that's seven months. Technically, yeah, really like it's really like nine months. How many months is that? February? I don't know. It's a lot of months. Let's just let's just say it's a lot of months, <laughs> and um, I, it shouldn't have been that long. So what end up, what might end up happening is it actually is worse than they're saying. Um, but it's also very specific. So maybe the reason why they took so long is because they wanted to get to the bottom of it, but it seems like everything about the patients that were included in this breach was essentially leaked. Yeah. Literally everything. So, um, good for them. I mean, for, yeah. uh, not good for them. Bad for them. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> good for the hackers. Yeah. Good for the hackers, I guess, but bad for everybody else i mean that's a lot of people I mean, that's like the population of oh, like yes rhode island yeah a small state a large or a medium almost sized a large city. state almost yeah. rhode island's population is in the millions but you get the idea i know what you mean next up extensive pci breach for grass valley grass valley california has announced an extensive data breach involving social security numbers driver's license numbers and health insurance information was leaked for all Grass Valley employees, former employees, spouses, dependents, and vendors. Anyone whose information was provided to the Grass Valley Police Department had their names, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, financial account information, payment card information, health insurance information, passport numbers, and more lost in the breach. The same goes for anyone who filled out a loan application at the Grass Valley Community Development Department. 
The city government said the breach began in 2021 on April 13th, and files were transferred out of the city's network until July 1st. By December, the city said it had a better understanding of the scope of information lost in the breach and began sending breach notification letters to victims on January 7th. Yeah, I don't trust municipalities or like local no. governments to protect my data at all. And they oh, absolutely with, not. Yeah, they deal with sensitive information. Just this is huge. Else. Yeah. Like they got everything. They got an entire they, yeah. a person's entire identity, social yep. security, driver's Same. license. Passport Same number. thing as the last one, pretty much, other than patient information, it's which I imagine if the city had patient information, it would have been leaked in this instance, too. So, yeah, I the city I live in, I pay utilities to the city. And every time I get a, a, the bill in the email in an email, it's like it flag it gets flagged as spam. So that just yeah. tells me that the cybersecurity that is in these cities and stuff is not good. And it's probably because of state budgets because they have other things to worry about, like infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hopefully some, some something happens on a federal or state level to help protect the cybersecurity of local governments so stuff like this doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to see if, like, PCI, like PCI DSS is the governing body that kind of deals with PCI. It'd be interesting to see if, like, a state, it's like on a, it's like on a federal level. So if it'd be f- interesting to see if the government sues the government or fines the government in this case, right? Like a federal level government fines a state local government. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Like here, I'm going to, it's like, you already pay us. I already pay you. So I'm going (laughs) to fine you. (laughs) Right. Interesting. But seriously, something needs to be done because they have to, it feels like some of the worst breaches are like breaches of government systems. Yep. They always are. They're just not that protected. It's really bad. Super mega hospitals or, uh, yeah, right. mega hospitals, mega health facilities. So there's no stopping it. It seems like there's no hope, but it just means you need to stay vigilant. And that's it for this week's wrap-up of your weekly healthcare news. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Alvaro Battistelli. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Bandage Podcast produced by eTactics.